Thank you for thank you for having me. Yeah, it's good to have you here. I'm Michael Colmeyer. Um, I have a small furniture business in Maysville, Kentucky. I build custom pieces, one-offs. Uh, I do wood, reclaimed wood, metal, leather. Um, I'm playing with the ECC and uh, GFRC concretes along with the wood. I did 18 years in heavy construction okay. and um, had a workplace injury. Tore out my shoulder and ruptured disc in my neck. And um, you know, they told me I was disabled and um, you know, at 30, 36 years old, I wasn't accepting that. So uh, my hobby became my business. Great, I love it. So, and, and honestly, it was a lot of pain, but it was a blessing because I don't go to work now. I love what I'm doing. Yeah, yeah, they, it's only work if you'd rather be somewhere else. Correct. What what got you, I, I you know read over your website and things, but what what got you into it? I mean, you you've been in this game for a while. I, I'm I'm the same as you. Ever since I was a, a young man, I wanted to fabricate and make stuff. So I, when I was super young, I remember my folks uh, took us all on a uh, um, dude ranch, one week dude ranch experience. And all my brothers and sisters were into the horses and the riding and all that. And I just wasn't. I wanted to take that week and go in the woods and build something. So I went in the woods and I found a bunch of little branches and, and wood twigs and, and whatnot. And I started whittling and carving and wrapping with leather. And I built a chair. And you know, I was 15 years old, 14 years old. And, and I was blown away that I could think of something and then go find the resources in Mother Nature and put them together and create something brand new and and there's just no other feeling in the world like it so that right. triggered something in me that uh has never gone away do you still have that piece no sadly <laughs> <laughs> i've moved about 800 times since then so, so I, I like um I, I like the artistic side of it um i'm i do sculpting and carving and you know things as as well and it's just anything to create yeah you know, that, that's it. Great. I think a lot more people have that that don't even know it. They never had an opportunity to explore it. I think you're absolutely correct. A lot of people say, well, you know, I, I can't do that. I wish I could. Well, have you tried? Yeah. Because you'll never know until you do. That's exactly right. Now, you right. have how many employees? What size is your business? Uh, right now, I've just downsized back to myself. I had... Uh, I had one full-time guy and um, three part-times, and um, I'm just trying to figure out where I need to be. Yep. Do um, you know I'm I'm I've done I've done one-offs, I've done restaurants, bars, and I'm trying to figure out, you know, with the employees and doing the the restaurants, I gross more money. I tough home less myself. Yeah. You know, so is it better to grow and if you do you know at what point does that turn around i mean that has to turn around at some point to where you're actually making money um that's a, a, a great point and a fair question i i started by myself as a one-man show and i had a daughter this was back in 97 and when my daughter was born i realized holy cow i can't really afford uh, the future that i want for my family with just my own two hands. I just didn't have that super high end clientele. And so I figured I had to scale up, I had to hire people. So I hired my first guy and uh, I put him on the clock and, and then I, I started paying him on payroll. And then I got a notice from the state of Arizona, the DES Department of Economic Security. And they said, hey, you uh, should be withholding child support from him. Um, and, and you have to turn that into the state. And I said, oh, I didn't know that. And I said, well, you have to get it from him or you have to pay it. And I said, well, well I, I didn't have a baby. I don't know. I don't even know the kids. I don't, I don't, know, I don't have a pay it. <laughs> they said, yeah, if you hire somebody and you don't collect the child support necessary, then, then you owe it. And I said, oh, my goodness. So it was a, a real quick, hard blow to the reality of, of being an employer. To be fair, when I grew my company to 30-some-odd employees, we were shipping furniture. I was building just wholesale barnwood furniture, so just to stores. We had a, we were all over the country and we were shipping our furniture like crazy and 30 employees and things were going rock and rolling. And I don't, I don't recall a year where I felt 
flush or I was making money and I was, it was worth it in that sense. I don't recall going, I made it. Okay, now this thing runs on its own. I'm getting paid. Every, I recall making a little bit more money every year, but having 10 times more work every year. You know, my, my increase in responsibility and, and trying to figure out how to manage this monster was just growing and growing and growing and growing. And that was right about when the, when the econ economic downturn happened and we atrophied as a company to survive. And that in 2010, I had kind of a, uh, not a breakdown, but a, I was over it. I said, you know what? I want a one man shop again. I want to go back to doing what started all this, doing what I love to do and not having to be the big international business owner. So, well, that, that answered a lot right there. Um, so, so with the pieces you're doing now, um, I see you have your lines. Do, are they production pieces? Do you keep inventory in stock or are you building to order? So what I'm doing now, I've taken it to the next level. And this is something for you to consider. And this is an interesting um, angle. Um, I design furniture for companies, two different companies and they manufacture it and sell it and deal with it and do everything. It's like, it's like I write a country song. Somebody else is performing it, someone else is promoting it to the radio, someone else is doing it, and I just get a percentage for my designs into perpetuity. So I get, I get a percentage forever. And I have a shop, I build the first prototype, or sometimes I'll just build the corner of the prototype because I'll have a real ingenious way of doing the connection or whatnot. So I'll have to build that and send that to the company and say, here's what we're working toward. And then they, I, I, of course, have to make the cut list and all that for all these pieces, but I, I don't have to build the whole piece sometimes. So you get to design and let someone else do all the uh, production. I like that. <laughs> I do high-end custom one-offs for customers when they're worth it to me, either financially or, or the project itself is just so cool and so rewarding. I want to do it and I'll do it. It's not about the money. It's about the project and, and whatnot. But I only I cherry pick those, and, and I only do those when I when I want to. <laughs> this is something to be to really be thinking about because um, I make I make about the same percentage for every piece of furniture that sells right now in my wholesale percentage agreement that I did when I owned the company and ran all the employees had all the headaches. I'm not the scale that we used to be. You know, we used to be doing two million dollars a year in sales. I haven't hit that point yet, but if I were to do 2 million in sales, I would take home the same amount of money for little to no work. Well, uh, am I allowed to ask, how do you find those kind of companies to partner with? Well, one thing is, is to have some good designs. So put together a portfolio of good designs and then find the companies that work well with yours. There's, there's a company I work with that would work well with you and it's named Green Gables Furniture and it's in Illinois. And they make barnwood furniture. They're making a lot of new stuff now. We're branching out in different directions. But they do barnwood furniture quite a bit and quite a bit of live edge. And he'll take on designers. He'll make a deal with you for a percentage uh, of each design. And then if your design sells, you get a check every month in the mail. I like that. To me, after this many years in the business and all the ups and downs and headaches and going from a one-man shop to a 30-man nightmare back to a one-man shop, this is kind of the ideal where I cherry pick the really good jobs. I stay busy, I stay in the world, and I make money off the good jobs, but I also have a passive revenue happening from the design. That's what I'm looking for. I, I'm, I'm facing the same dilemma that you you faced earlier, and that's, you can I can only create so much with two hands. Yep. And I want more, but I still want to create. Yeah. So how to make it happen, and um, you know, I've looked at things doing doing the smaller pieces say cutting boards candlesticks things like that that i can run production wise and maybe selling those for bread and butter and still allowing me to do the one-off table or the bedroom suit things like that i may not have grown plus i have no education i've learned as i went it took me a long time to figure out how to play the game and be a businessman so with all those factors my company could have done way better had it been in different circumstances. Um, but with that said, I would, even if I was making five times as much money back then, I prefer my life now. 
<laughs> my brother won't ask me. My brother's a, a very, very, very wealthy and well to do attorney in Phoenix. He does real well. And he, he called me on Sunday and he said, where are you? And I said, I'm in my shop. And he's like, geez, Tim, what are you doing? You're in your shop every day. What are you doing? Take a Sunday off. And, and I thought, I was like, like, wow, that's, maybe I am doing something wrong because I'm not as wealthy as him. He's doing something right. And then I thought, Matt, if I won the lottery, you know where I'd be on Sunday? Right here. Yep. <laughs> yep. I, I agree wholeheartedly. My wife asked what I'd do if I won the lottery. And I was like, well. I would do what I'm doing now. I just wouldn't have the headache of, of yeah. And your tools would be a little bit newer, and your shop would be a little warmer, and you know whatever. <laughs> it's some scalable stuff, but it'd be pretty much the same thing. Um, did did you 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 said you learned as you as you went? Did you have a business plan per se? Because you know when I started out, and the reason I asked the when I started out, um, you know. Some mentors told me you have to have a business plan. You have to have your roadmap. Well, I sort of did that, and it's changed beard so much from where I started. You know, because I've had to learn as I go. I've had to um, change and to to survive. Yeah, sure. Yeah, and so it's you know. Is a business plan other than a loan? That's a, that's a fantastic question, Michael, and, and I love this question. I have had multiple different businesses. When I started Western Heritage, it was in 91, there was no internet, and, and you went to the library and checked out books and you learned how to do Japanese joinery and how to manufacture and cut and build. And, and, and so there was, it, it was, I didn't have a business plan that wasn't part of it. It was stumbling through as I went. Once I got to a certain point, I hired people and my company grew to a certain scale and I needed to go look for investment money. I put together a business plan, full five year with a two year and a one year. So, so we built a big business plan. We went out seeking money. We did all the right things that we were supposed to do. With that said, the world has changed so incredibly since that time to now. We live in this instant world of information and the ability to change and, and shift directions right now is a great asset. It used to be a liability that if you were chugging along and you're going, you're working towards this goal and you got sidetracked, you would lose that end result. Nowadays, opportunities pop out and if you're not flexible and wide awake and aware, you can miss out on some really, really great opportunities. So a business plan is uh, in the old school way is to me uh, antiquated. Now, having a vision and making a vision board and saying, here's where I want to be. Here's how I want to live. Here's my dream is more important today than ever before. Meaning you want to live like this. You want this much income revenue, whatever you want to have in the big picture and having the goals that you want and, and remembering those five years from now, here's where I want to be. I want to be financially able to retire. I want to be there and, and writing those down and having a vision is really important because when that opportunity pops up and someone says, Hey, I'm doing this 3D printed thing, but I want to inlay barn wood into it and do a real modern blah, blah, blah. You can go, that will work towards my vision. That will help me get where I'm going. And so you can jump onto that or you can look at another opportunity and go, that sounds like a lot of fun, but that's just going to sidetrack me and I'm not going to get where I want to go. Go have fun, but I'm not going to make any money. So having your personal vision and your personal five-year, eight-year, 10-year plan is, is more important than ever. But having a legitimate, bona fide market business plan, the market changes so rapidly and so crazy right now that, that there's, I don't find any value in that. How do you get in front of the people that are able to buy the one-off airlines? Did that happen for you? Were you always doing that? Or did that happen after uh, Ellen's design? Oh, I was doing it long before that. Matter of fact, Ellen uh, called me, her people, Michael called me um, and brought, invited me on the show because I had a video that uh, for the expanding round table that had over 2 million hits. So she saw the video and said, Hey, I like this guy, call him up, find him. So they found me and brought me on board. And so, and that expanding round table wholesale for $14,000. So I was, and that was in 03. I think that video was shot. So I was doing that long before before Ellen, as far as that high end market. Gotcha. Um, what what happened with the high end market was a couple of things. One, we live in a much better world than we were in 03. Oh, when I was starting to push, like in 1999, 
was when I really started ramping up and started building the business and going after that high-end clientele. There was no internet. There was no way of communicating your vision other than $4,500 ads and cowboys and Indians or the, you know, the rags and the papers and, the, and that sort of thing. And so um, what I did was I went to the stores that sold the high end in Aspen and Vail and Telluride and, and Sun Valley. And so these areas that were super wealthy people, my furniture was in those stores with okay. my tags on it. And I made it a deal to leave my tags on because my tags told the story of the building that was disassembled. So I would go and research the building and I would say this was in this county and this, that, and the other, and it was used as a mule barn. And I would write the story and hang that tag with my, with my identification on it. They wouldn't take the tag off because the tag added value to the finished furniture. So they left my tags on. So eventually my brand and my name got out there amongst the elite because they were buying my furniture in these high end towns. So that's how I got it. It was more of a backdoor way uh, passively by going and working with the stores that catered to the super rich. That, that was a thought to take that route at some point. If I were to do it today, I would maybe selectively uh, get a couple of stores. I would put together a couple of lines that were design driven, meaning they were really cool looking, but not super labor intense so that you don't okay. hurt yourself. Get a couple of those things going. You know, like a like a desk, a small office desk is always something good for for those um, those kind of environments because every every one of those houses has an office in it. You dumb them down so you can really knock them out, but they really look cool. And then, and so so that that's a way to get in there and start meeting some of those clients because that Teton uh, store or that that Jackson Hole store will call you and say, hey, they like the office desk. They want a credenza behind it. Will you make that for me? And you say, yeah, and you give them the bid and the price, and then they, they say yes. And now you're talking directly with the customers a lot of time. You're delivering to the customers, and then that, you build that relationship. But that would, be a, that would be one of my passive avenues that I would take because it doesn't hurt you. It's good for you. It's good for your vision. You got furniture in high-end stores. It's good for your reputation, good for everything. So it's not a bad thing. Gives me a also gives me an excuse to get out uh, out west. <laughs> this, having worked with these stores, they're desperate for new design. They're desperate for new design. And nowadays you can reach them via the internet or via direct messaging. There's a way to get to them where before you had to go knock on their door and say, hey, I got something in my truck I want to show you. And they had to be in a good mood. And then they had to come out to your truck and then you had to pull it out of the truck and unwrap the blanket off of it, go through this whole process, which is what we did. Every That's the only thing we ever did. But it was a long, painful, expensive process to sell furniture. I'm, I'm one of those guys, I, I have a vision, I want to build it. Once I build it, I'm done. You know, I want to move to the next one. I wouldn't be happy in production then because I went into production. And we would have <laughs> lines and lines of beds up on the floor going like seven or eight deep of the same exact bed that I designed. And I thought it was cool in the beginning. And I'd walk in the shop and go, ah, oh, more of these beds. Like, it's not, it takes all the fun out of it. So, so no, you wouldn't. Now, sometimes you have to do stuff you don't like to do in order to get where you want to be. So if you want to get in shape and you want to go win a, a some kind of m m tough mudder or triathlon, you got to do some stuff you don't like to do to get to that level. So you may have to do some stuff that you don't like to do to get there, but that's only stepping stones in the process of getting to that end goal. So, yeah. so and that's why I say dumb it down so your designs are not super complicated and challenging so that they don't make it really hard on you, the producer. If you do make a sale of four or five or six pieces, it's not, you're not pulling your hair out. Two other things I would work on is I would work on some portfolio design stuff that you could sell exclusive or, or as designs to some builders. Today's world, um, this is going to probably ca catch you out of left field, um, but, but I'm a true believer. There's a lot of inexpensive marketing out there that can reach and target specific people. If you have a great product with a great story, Facebook ads are still very inexpensive and they chase around the demographic that you want to chase. They chase okay. the person building a log cabin. So if you're saying, I want to find the people building a log cabin that are paying more than a million dollars or whatever, and you start figuring out and you can start chasing ads for people who are doing that and what and they're building a log cabin. It doesn't hurt them that something pops up in this cool barnwood desk pops up. Hey, I like that. That could go on my new log cabin. So, so one of my point of that is it's very, very direct and very inexpensive ad space. I spent a lot of money on ad space over the year, over a million dollars on ad space over the years. 
And the, the today's world, the Facebook ads and the Instagram ads are very, very valuable, very good. So it's, it's worth the money, $20 here, $50 campaign here, where you try to target. You, if you have a product, obviously you have to have something that visually they see and go, oh, I gotta zoom in on that to make the ad pay. But if you've got a product that, that, that would, would intrigue them, you know, boom. Gonna leave it up to you to how to answer it because I don't wanna get too personal into your business. Um, but where, I don't even know how to ans ask it. Um, where can the business go as far as what can what can you ask for a piece of furniture when you hit that high end oh for, I feel mean, free to ask i um so an office desk a nice really nice full-size ex executive office desk you know we call it the presidential desk uh -huh. it'll re it's nice and it's got copper inlay and it's got barnwood and cherry and walnut and, and everything finished and soft clothes and beautiful and, and nice um, but it's an all wood piece of furniture with a leather insert for a writing pad is a retail of, of 18 to 25,000 depending on the size and, and amenities. Um, a coffee table um, with nice leather inserts is between $3,000 and $7,000. And literally in, in our retail price points, we have $3,000 coffee tables and we have $7,000 coffee tables. Um, okay. Uh, you know, a hall table is the same basic price point, point, twenty-five and sixty-five hundred. Um, I don't do any upholstery, but most of it's mostly all wood furniture. Um, but a dining, our dining tables, forty-five hundred bucks for a nice uh, barnwood dining trestle dining table. Retail. My my most expensive piece so far has been uh, eight thousand dollar table. Um, Was that so, the one with the concrete in it? No, it wasn't. Uh, I no. like that. I like the the old wood and the concrete. I like the barn wood and the concrete. And I like I like the mix of the concrete with the industrial with some steel. I think you got something cool. There. Working with your hands has been considered a secondary occupation versus working with your brains or your talents. And we've lost that. But but when Mother Teresa did all she did, it was because she was so passionate about, it and that's what she wanted to do with her day. Not because she was miserable doing it, she hated it, but she needed to be a good person to go to heaven. Yeah. Because that was her calling. And so if your calling is to make cool stuff with your hands, then you have to figure out every route that it goes. Now, if it's to help people and make cool stuff with your hands. That to me is a bonus bonus. You yeah. know, it's, yeah. you know, give it, given a gift for a reason. And, and, you know, I, yeah, I want to make a good living for myself, but if I can help others with my gift, and I that's, think that's the way we change the world. Oh, great, Michael. Um, I hope I gave you some information that uh, you can use. You did uh, a lot, actually. Well, I'm here. Like I said, it's, it's, a, it's the craftsman's way to help each other. And, and if you have questions, whatever, shoot me a text or shoot me an email and, and let's follow up on it. I'll help you guide and navigate as best as I can. Anyways. I appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah, great.